Good morning. My name is Jamie Mara, and I'm with the Dairy Business Association. Who here is feeling overwhelmed by all the data from your herd management systems? Or at least isn't feeling you are getting the most from them? The challenge is to take the data we gather daily and turn them into valuable information to run the dairy. In this presentation, Ricardo Dara will focus on how we need to continue unlocking the power of data and analytics, determine an ideal state in the future, and better apply the insights we have to everyday decision making. Mr. Dara is a global product line director for ruminants and pork at Cargill Digital Insights. He has previously served Cargill through different management positions, focused in business development and strategic marketing, both in local and global roles. He is a trained economist and has passion for service excellence and innovation. Ricardo lives in Madrid, Spain. Mr. Dara. Okay, thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having me here at the Data Strong Conference. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to walk you through some 35, 40, 40 minutes and a few slides about what is farm, farm data management, what are the value that exists out there, and how you should be a start considering the data that you have in your farm in different systems and softwares as a, capabil uh, 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 as a capability that you need to start thinking through, that you need to develop for the future success of your operation. Hopefully, I'll be able to bring some tips and, 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 and information that will help you to, to decide how you're going to be moving in the next few months or years. But certainly, this is something that every single farmer should start thinking through to see how they're approaching this opportunity. The untapped value in a, in a dairy farm is, is significantly. The opportunity that is there is considerable, and it's the right time to start thinking as new technologies come to market. There's no doubt, and you know this much better than I do, that a dairy farm has lots of data. It's not a business that is run without data. You're producing data from your milking robots, herd management softwares, the visits from your consultants, your own people. So that data is all around. The problem with the data that we have is that not stored in a proper manner, that we can use the best use of it. That's a situation that has been happening for years. The studies that says that you're probably using 10 to 15% of the data that you get access to because it's just not right, rightfully stored uh, and processed. You collect data or your consultants helping you on daily operation, collect data on spreadsheets. Uh, spreadsheet, sorry. They take down notes on pen and papers when they do a walkthrough. You get data from farm computers, milking robots, Sometimes you're starting now to have apps that help you to take down data and are collected in that app device. All those data are scattered. All those data are not accessed from a single, da uh, single database so you can make the best possible use of those data. So you got information, which is already good. There's a lot of things that you can have on a daily basis to see how your operation is going forward. You can measure, track, and understand your KPIs and what is working well, what is not working well. But you are not developing an asset. That information, to be meaningful to your decision making, has to be processed in a way that will help you to make decisions upon that information. To do so, there are two fundamental things that you need to have in consideration. One is to have a data management system that collects as much of the relevant data that are meaningful to run analytics, and second, is that power of the analytics. You need to get a situation where data will not only be powerful per, per, uh, per se, but it will also be an asset that will help you to increase your returns on other investments that, that you have made along the years. You got the investment in robotics, you got the investment in uh, feeding system, you got the, 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 the uh, investments in your, new, uh, in your new pen, stalls, etc. There's a lot of investment that you have been doing in the past in your farms, and there is a lot of data coming from those systems that can be used in a different, ma in a different manner. That analysis, per se, is valuable. That analysis applied to the way you use your existing investment is going to increase your return by a lot. So think about it as an opportunity, not only a standalone, 
but in, co in combination with everything that you have been investing for years in your farm, okay? Why now? So you got the data, lots of data from the past years. It's been, uh, this is not new to anyone. Why now? So the industry has been working on, on software, algorithms, artificial intelligence, you name it. And not everyone knows exactly what those words mean. I'm not either know every time what they mention, what they mean by that. But it's certainly an increasing uh, power on the technology side to be able to run data. Furthermore, the industry has been focused in the past to apply this kind of intelligence into other industries, mostly uh, airplane industry, but also very, very much related with consumer. Everything that was applied, understanding how we behave as consumers, whether it's in the social media or it's in a store, is where the industry has been investing. The industry is now moving to other spaces and seems for the past year, a couple of years, you, you read in the, you've read in the papers, heard in the news, that agriculture is gonna be the next big thing for artificial intelligence, big data. The good thing is that the systems are there. We need to find out how to apply it to our business, to our industry, but certainly this is gonna take us to a, to a much better situation to do a good use of our data. So, today, we get access to the data in a way that helps us to understand where we are. It's very much of an analysis of a historic situation. We can probably understand the performance versus our targets. So we know what things are working well, what things are not working well. What we don't have today by the way we treat data, what we don't have today because we are not applying the right analytics, is data telling us what is the next thing that I should be doing in my farm. Based on my current situation, based on the critical variables performance, what are the turning points that are gonna bring me to the next level? That is done only when you apply high level technologies in a proper data lake, okay? Today, the information is scattered, so those different sources that we were talking about at the beginning are not connected. So it's hard to find what are the dependencies between the different variables, uh, how, how different uh, measurements are affecting other performance indicators that we care about. It's not optimal, it's just as simple as that. There's a lot of data that you don't have the time to use it. No business has the time to use the, all of the data that they produce. This has to be a way that is easy, is meaningful, and is actionable for you to use the data. It's very difficult to derive actionable information. Yes, I know this is, this is happening, I know I'm not achieving my goals, I know the trend is going down in meal production, my meal quality, health issues in my farm, what do I do now? So what is the advice that should come from that analysis? Systems are moving to get us to that situation, and I think that something's gonna be soon in the market, but today the way we're using data and the information is just not helping us enough to make decisions. Consequently, it sometimes leads us to misinterpret what is most important for us. We measure a limited number of data, we made decisions based on a limited number of KPIs, so sometimes we made the wrong decision. We should be able, in every single circumstance, under my farm conditions to take the right decision by using the, the right data, okay? That's not the situation today. The other thing that as we go forward into this data venture and the industry starts to bring data together, today most of the farms are isolated. So one thing that, uh, one difficulty that comes in place because of that is that it's harder to, to, to benchmark. So what are others doing in this specific indicator? Am I one of the top 10 producers? Are there rooms that I should focus to improve my performance? What should I be doing based on the comparison with my peers? That's one thing, but that's probably not the most important value of getting farms connected in one system. Artificial intelligence, big data science, computer science, call it whatever, are very much dependent on big data lakes. The fact that you can bring together your data with other farmers' data allows the engineers, the scientists, that are capable of using the data to keep improving the accuracy of the, of the solution, of the, of the algorithms, of the data, of the artificial intelligence agents that they apply to your data. So the fact that things are not coming into one single or one common data lake is preventing us to go faster in finding ways to give you more timely, accurate, and relevant information to make decisions, okay? It's, it's easy to say, there's no question that this 
brings a lot of challenges to the industry. This brings a lot of challenges to, to, to dairy farmers. Um, bringing the data lake into a, into a way that it can be used to run advanced analytics is not of easy things, fairly complex. Data are stored differently from uh, timelines, way to calculate the, the, the KPIs, differently in, in different systems. So bringing them into one single database is complex, it's fairly complex. It's a work that takes time, that takes professionalism, that takes experience. But it's more than that. Do you know that a farm is very much <clears throat> in connection with advisors that work with you, whether it's a nutrition advisor, whether it's a genetics, whether it's a, it's a, it's a veterinarian, they are helping you to run your, your farm on a daily basis. They are people working with you to achieve the best of the result. The fact that you're getting the right situation with the data might not be enough. You need to have your partners with that mentality, with the mindset, with the willingness to move into a different way to work so they can have data that they can use in your benefit. They are capable of sharing data with others, so there's only one single source of truth, so everyone involved in making a decision on your farm operation can be benefited from that. So that's a challenge beyond the technical aspects. It's a challenge in the way we relate with our vendors, with our partners, and how we work together. So the way the industry will shape this data, data management um, system is gonna be very critical of how much value you can extract at the very end. Uh, at the very end of, the, of, this, of, this, of this venture. Nevertheless, the opportunity is much worth. As I said before, untapped value is tremendous. When we have run ourselves um, data analysis trials in different farms, group of farms, in dairy but also in other species, you really find out that there are ways that you can do better. Sometimes because you, you find better insights, many times because you're gonna be advised timely sooner that you'd find out in a different way, so you prevent getting a situation where you, 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 are, you, have, you are running troubles. Basically, uh, avoiding unexpected events is one of the short-term values of managing your data in a, in a different way. Don't be surprised when something is going wrong. Be alerted that something might go wrong. That helps you to take action on and avoid economical or production losses. The value of what you apply has to be uh, derived in what I said before, it has to be actionable, but it has to be delivered in a way that is identifying the turning points of your farms. Every one of you has systems that is alerting you with something that's not going wrong. The technology, companies involved, the way we treat data, your partners, they need to be able to tell you at some point in the next future, what are the different things that you can do in your farm is the best thing that you should do understand the correlation between different variables, understand the circumstances where your operation happens, and what does it mean in your decision-making process, okay? So um, the ability to, 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 to run long-term scenarios, mitigate the risk, has to do with a lot of things. Obviously the animal performance, obviously the nutrition component, but also the meal prices, the meal prices futures, the ingredients prices today, the ingredients prices tomorrow. It has to do with uh, my herd structure, it has to do with so many things. Now, when you sit down on your, on your desktop, uh, on your desk, and start looking at the data, it's, 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 very, it's very difficult that you're gonna get to the right conclusion at the right time. Technology should help you to get to the situation where you can identify the right action at the right time. Both things are very important, okay? So, <clears throat> I'm fairly new to this industry, so excuse me if I use some wrong terminologies or, I've uh, been five years working for Cargill in relation with dairy farming, so already had the time to learn a little bit. Um, and my colleagues on the consultancy side always ask me, how does this technology help me to do better with my customers? How am I gonna be a better consultant? Why should I be leaning my expertise on technology and reducing a little bit the, 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 the personal people contribution to the advice that I give to my farmer? I don't, I don't see it at all that way. I've heard from them many, many times that uh, talking about the art and the science of dairy farming. And I don't think that the art, the people's talent and the people's quality can go in a way. What we're trying to do is make science much better, much more relevant, much more timely, and a way that it can be used by consultants and farmers to take the right decisions. So we need to move from gut field recommendations that are based on limited information, it's maybe based on what happened in the past, a decision that I made with this farm three years ago, 
to the decision that is data driven. So what are the facts today? What is the circumstance that is affecting that performance in this specific farm? So I'm making the decision today for these circumstances. It has to be proactive. I'm gonna mention timely a lot of time because that's one of the big uh, benefits that we're gonna get. Be surprised by a drop in milk production, being surprised by a drop in milk quality, being surprised by reproduction problems should not happen. We should be advised before data, variables, they tell us trends. You can analyze a lot of patterns in the way data work, in the way animals behave that will anticipate, hey, we might be having a problem. Why don't you take a look? And these are the three, four variables that might be affecting that situation. Why don't we take action upon that? That is still people will take action. That is still the expertise, the years of working with you, the, the education and the training will be important. But technology should put us in a much better way to take that decision. So with all of that at the end, we're gonna be able to be more strategic in the way we, we design our future being able to long-term plan, but also being able to consider all of the today's and tomorrow circumstances around prices, around demand of the milk, around competition in my area. I'm gonna make, us make, make a strategic decisions in investment, of course, but also in the way that I'm preparing my people, in the way that I'm approaching my different milk channels, et cetera, et cetera. Moving forward opportunistic to a strategic is a big, big thing. And uh, it's gonna also prevent possible failures as you consider the big picture in the future and the different alternatives that you might have. So we expect advisors, obviously nutrition advisors, but anyone working with you that will become farm experts, that their companies will provide them with the right tools and the right assets to be able to work with you in a different way. Expect from them to be able to talk about it. Expect from them to be able to work about it. Expect to them to be able to provide a solution that will help you to manage better the data that they use on a daily basis with you. Okay. I'm gonna tell you a little bit around the Cargill story because I'm talking about how you use your data on the daily farm, but you can talk about the same thing about Cargill, and I'm talking now about ourselves. Cargill is a company that has been, I would say, fairly good using data in the past, okay? We have been very conscious that our ability to use data it was very relevant to provide the best possible nutrition advice to our customers. So we were aware of that. We have been using different technologies and systems like labs or NIR equations uh, on the ingredient size to really be able to detect uh, what are the nutrient contribution of different ingredients, what is the net cost per nutrient contribution per ingredients, how do we use it in formulation, what's gonna be the digestibility of certain ingredients. So we have been fairly doing good in that respect. We are using that information together with some animal biology models and nutritional models to build our product formulation. So the product that we, we produce in our plants to be delivered to your farms are considering all those data. Does this ingredient have the right nutrient composition? Is it digestible enough to provide the performance that I expect on a, on a cow? Should I change something? So we're always using data to provide the best possible formulation and deliver the right product. When we go into a diet formulation, same thing as well. Also considering some animal biology and some uh, situations on farm uh, that body condition score, uh, chop length, et cetera, et cetera, that might affect intake, that might affect the, the way the animals are behaving. So also eventually might affect the performance of the different diets. So we had some data mindset. We had some ideas about how to treat data. We've been 30 years, not only capturing the data, but also saving the data and using them to keep improving our equations, our lab methodologies, our transform of those data inputs into nutritional models or, or, or production models into the animal biology. We've been using to also understand what are the different suppliers that are bringing the best value in the relation that we did with them. So at the very end, the cost of the ingredient was not enough. We are buying nutrients. So we wanted to know what was the net nutrient cost and what was the variability into that nutrient cost to really know how we apply that into, into a nutritional advice for all of you, okay? So kind of, we had mentality about data. We have people working on data. We have the ability to access those databases, integrate them in, into the system, but certainly it was not good enough. So it was not good enough as we go forward. Today, the farm is collected manually and is introduced in the system by our consultants and they use it to make decisions. That is absolutely true. But whether that is true, the system is not fully automated, that's one. 
And the second thing is we are considering ingredients, nutritional biology, information in cost, information into that, but we are not integrating wider farm data that are relevant for making decisions. Uh, if you could in introduce into that decision making where you're going to change a diet and you're going to reformulate uh, some of the, of the feed you give to the animals, what are the current body condition score of my pen? What are the current intake of these animals in this specific pen? That's extremely relevant information to, to achieve the goals that we go after. So ourselves has challenged what we're doing. And recently, six months ago, we decided to put a specific unit that we call Digital Insights to think through that. We have making significant progress in, into that to move it to the next step. So what is the next step? And this is obviously not, not us. This is the way we are looking at farms. I don't want to talk too much about us today. Um, if we are capable of integrating more farm data into a, data, into a database, into the decision making system, it will increase the total overall value of the system. There are mostly four, you can challenge there are more than that, but basically you can resume the four types of different data that are relevant to be used on a farm data model and to be used to take decision. The first one would be input data. For example, what we provide you with when we send you a, a feed design with nutrient content, et cetera, that is one. That affects the way the whole system is gonna perform in the future. Can be also a vaccination program, can be medication, anything that you bring into your farm that will be an input to the animal, an input to your operation. There's another aspect that needs to be controlled where we've been doing some, some work in the past year and getting to, to a reasonably good state today, which is output data. Output data is having the ability to measure as many as possible of the performance data you have in your farm, from obviously milk production, milk production per cow, milk content, milk content per cow, health records, re reproduction records, going beyond that and to anything that is relevant to, to understand farm performance, okay? The other two things that are, some companies are working on it, there will be more technology coming in the, ne in the next two years because there's a lot of focus in this area, as I said before. One of this is farm environment. Farm environment, farm environment, sorry, can be considered things more, let's say, basic like temperature or humidity, but you can start considering things like uh, feed banker management, how well or bad I'm doing that. Can I track that? Can I extrapolate? Can I, can I use that information to, to bring you alerts, to bring you advice of you should be changing this? It can be things like pen hierarchy. Is the, is the grouping that I have affecting the productivity? Is there something that I should be doing? Can I track that? Can I use that information to provide advice? Um, these kind of things would be considered as, 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 as far environment. The fourth piece of, of data is animal behavior, animal activity, where you probably here every week or so, new companies coming into this space. But we should be able to, to have this 360 vision about a, about a farm. And the animal behavior piece is extremely important. This is where you can really accelerate uh, your technology capability, where you can really have more timely data inputs from individual animals that will build a more, a more, a more solid and a more valuable data lake. Things like individual intake, individual drinking, uh, activities that the animals are playing, um, all of that measured in an efficient way. And when I say efficient, means with the, with, the right level of, with the right level of intervention with the animal, making sure that we're also respectful with uh, animal welfare concerns. And at the right price, it's gonna be critical in the industry. So the, the moment you can bring that into input, output, far environment, animal behavior, into a data lake, and obviously we will start in a situation that will get much better in the next few years, everything comes in place to start running advanced analytics. You give the, you give the minimum capability to big data science to bring what they know into a decision-making dashboard that will help you to make decisions. When you go into that, your farm performance will be much better under control. Today, you have your farm performance under control. The fact that this will be done, again, said again, timely, is gonna anticipate problems, it's gonna prevent you to be surprised by any possible event in your farm. But more than that, it's gonna develop prognosis, forecasting capabilities. So you will be able to understand what's gonna happen with a barn, with a pen, with an animal in the future, in the next three years. So it will help you also to understand what decisions you wanna be taking about culling or any other nutritional uh, input that you wanna to give to an animal, because you will have the opportunity to understand what's gonna happen there. It will help you to enhance decisions, like for example, what if analysis. Okay, I am today, this is the forecast performance of this animal, of this pen, but what happens if the conditions change? What happens if the temperature change? What happens if the prices of the ingredients change? 
what happens even if my, my customers are demanding 20% more meal for me in the, in the next two years. How can I do it? What is the best way to go? Should I have more animals? Should I invest in make my, products, make my production more efficient? What should I do? What is the best course of action that I should be taking? So I know there are, there are many concerns. I've been talking quite a lot in the past year with many dairy farmers about data privacy. It's how are you going to be using my data? There's a lot of uh, questions about what is the right technology to be, uh, to be applied in my farm? There are a lot of questions as who is the right partner? And those are very fair questions, all of them. And you need to make sure that you feel comfortable with how the people treat your data. You need to feel comfortable how uh, the technology is applicable into your farm and who is behind that technology so they keep sustaining the value of that technology. But what is also true is that the pace of change is not going to be faster. And it will be even again faster next year and the year after it will be again that way. Technology is really disrupting many industries. Um, probably we will hear in the next year or so, companies that are complete outsiders to animal nutrition or agriculture entering this space. You've probably heard rumors about Google or other companies bringing technologies. That's gonna disrupt the industry, the way we can do business, and, uh, and you need to be ready for that, okay? I think you have a tremendous value versus all those new newcomers into the industries. You know, you, know, you know the dairy farming, you know the industry, you know the animals, so that's a tremendous asset. But you cannot forget that this is really changing the way we're going forward. So I'm going to give you a little bit of our vision. I would see this, 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 this data strategy so you can start thinking through what you want to do in the future and start challenging your partners, challenging your, your vendors, how, how we're going to be working together in the future. In our personal opinion, you can, a dairy farm is a fairly complex system. Uh, some people would see it differently because agriculture and, and rural lives, and it's a fairly complex system. There's a lot of things that affects your productivity. There's a lot of things that you need to have in consideration. So I would not advise anyone to make assumptions, take strong decisions uh, by looking at individual or very limited number of data points. You need to have enough of the relevant data points into that decision-making database so you will be empowered to take the right decision, okay? Do not feel good with limited number of data because that might not be enough as we go forward. Try to bring something meaningful that is relevant to you and that makes sense for, for making the, 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 to generating the insights. So the challenge and why multiple data points are important is because depending on the data that we have access to, Oops, sorry, the microphone. <laughs> the, the, depending on the data that we have access to, depending on um, the ability that we have to run analytics over that database, the alternatives in the way we might go in the future might be multiple. But probably there's only one or two that are correct. To be able to choose the right one, that's why you need a comprehensive data lake. That's why you need to have measurements that are right, are accurate, are at time being put into that database so you will be empowered to make the decision. When you think through uh, how my data strategy is going to look like, how do I partner with other people, have in consideration what is your daily needs, obviously. That's probably the first thing you need to do. But have also in consideration the, the, the wider picture, the big picture of what the industry challenges are in the future. You all know demand is going to grow in the, in the next few years in the world. And export countries like the US, you need to be able to serve that, that big demand. That's probably going to put pressure on your cost also at some point because there are other countries catching up. So make sure that you consider all those scenarios when you, you're going. You're going to have less access to labor. That is a problem that we see in Western countries growing every year. So how a data system can help you today and especially in the next two, three years to reduce, to mitigate the problem that qualified labor access represents for you. Can I have a system? that will allow me to work with the accessible labor that I have today in the most profitable way that I can. They'll take also in consideration the growing influence from consumers and some meal processors trying to shape the way we do business, bringing into the decision making things like animal welfare, sustainability, um, traceability, which 
obviously everything is a very fair way to be done, but you need to be ready for the high and demanding consumer request because they're going to be put pressure on branded retailers to provide it with the information and the right data sets to prove that we are treating animals right, that we are doing this under a sustainable way, and that we are uh, able to trace every single element that goes into the, into the mouth of the consumer. Okay? Those are things that might not be today the most urgent thing to think through, but have it in consideration as you think about the big picture of what you want to go with your data strategy. So, some basic design of what a platform might look like, things that you need to have in consideration when you talk to, to people. So it has to have a powerful data collection. It has to bring data from different sources of data that are relevant to your decision making. One single source of data might not be enough. Make sure that you understand well how that data can be, data lake, sorry, can be complete, can be comprehensive, can be valuable to you. Make sure that they are applying more than simple KPIs or reports. That's good, that's today. But make sure that they are thinking through and they are working in applying data science. Make sure that your investment together, even if it's just time, on building that database is gonna pay off in the future as analytics, big data science, help you to take the right decision. And also make sure that you understand what is the farm dashboard in that uh, you're gonna have access to. We could be creating a fantastic data lake we could be creating big data science. If the information is not delivered to you the way you need it, it's again, it's again non meaningful. You will not be able to take action. Make sure that it's not a big list of things that will tell you, like, seems like, wow, this is great, there's a lot of information, because again, you go back to the first slide situation. Lots of papers, lots of information, but it's not an asset. Make sure that they consider the way they deliver the value to you. And even more, that if you have different people working on your farm, the vendor is considering the different personas, so the different use we make that information so they can customize it. So what one of your employees might be needing from a data perspective is completely different to, to what you will be needing on a daily basis. Okay? Those three things are important as you go and discuss about that potential solution. Just to bring something from out of the industry, to, to, to give you flavor, something that my personal belief is doing, is doing fairly good, which is General Electric's, uh, with a platform that they call Critics. If you go into General Electric, they have like tons of data about what they do, so if you feel you have curiosity about that, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, they apply this to the uh, windmills, but also to things like airplane engines, and basically they have developed a system that collects all that data. Data from what is the productivity of the windmill? How much energy is consuming, blah, blah, blah. But also it's introducing sensors in a windmill or, a, or an engine, so they help through a lot of complex analytics, their uses to make decisions. For example, they have reduced by billions the need to do maintenance on planes. But even more, they have been able to keep the planes on the air, and I don't exactly remember, but something like 18% more that they normally were, which is this is money in the pocket for the, for the airplane industry. So if you do things right, there's amped up value that you can get access to. Transform this into your industry, transform this into a dairy farming. This is what you should be expecting. G has been working probably like four or five years into that and the dairy industry is starting for the past year. So, so, but that's where people working with you need, need to target for, bring you that distinctive value. What kind of the same flow of data can, can look like in a, in a dairy farm? So obviously you need to collect data from productivity, you need to collect data from nutrition, you need to collect data from health, that's whether vaccination programs, what you're giving to the animals, but also health records, reproduction records, heat detection records, information about, about comfort, and you bring it together with all of the farm uh, management software, whether milking robots, CMR, or herd management software, into a decision-making platform, where it considers all that in a way that can put <clears throat> sorry, can put in, uh, in correlation the different variables to bring you the best advice. At the very end, you're going to be moving as you build a better data lake and you get, the you get applied better analytics, moving from monitoring, assessment the condition, probably of individual animal, into forecasting what's going to happen with my pen, with my barn, into making what if decisions, uh, decisions based on what, is what if analysis on my business level. For that, again, you need that data lake, you need the power of the analytics. Today, 
we are here in conditioning, in, in, in assessment, and condition, and monitoring to move forward at pen or business level. You need to start thinking, how do I make sure that I have partners that help me to understand what data lake do I need and how that data lake is going to be treated, okay? Even more, and going back to that basic uh, kind of platform design, and you see below those things that intend to represent sensors, the more sensors that you can introduce in a farm, and obviously they need to work, they need to be accurate, they need to be, they need to be cost effective, so not, not everything is valid, but the more of those that you can introduce in a farm will give you the opportunity to do all that that it was in the previous slide. So forecast and do what if analysis, not only on my business level, but even at some point, and more individual cow level. So you can really stretch the performance of individual animals, and you can also uh, achieve things like cow comfort, uh, sorry, <coughs> sorry, cow comfort or sustainability. The more efficient you will make every single animal of your farm, the more sustainable you will make your operation. So there's, there's, there's very tangible value in applying new technologies so you're able to measure more frequently, more accurately at a more detailed level of your farm, okay? So data and analysis are in the core of the advisor model. And I said at the beginning, there are challenges and this is complex. You work with a lot of people. Make sure that the people you're gonna start relating with, or you already relate with, are ready. You're thinking through this. They're companies, they're bringing the right capabilities to be able to serve you in the way you, you're gonna be demanding in the next future. And that means, again, the ability to collect relevant data from multiple sources. The ability to have big data lakes that will keep Generating more, generating more valuable information, more valuable insights as we go forward. Having the ability to have this multi-far comparison, as I said, for benchmarking purposes, but especially to really have big data science applied into the data farming. It is about company that through partnering, through development, through acquisition, whatever model works, that's fine. But I'm thinking also, what are the right sensors that you should be applying to a farm and how they're gonna extract the value from those sensors, okay? There are a lot of things, and there are a lot of good things, but just make sure that you're picking the right thing when you apply it to your farm. Uh, make sure, again, the dashboard, the visualization and the information, it has to be proactive. It has to anticipate potential situations. It has to help you to avoid problems. It's good, but it's not good enough to tell you something is wrong. Okay, great. Could have you been telling me this three months ago, so we could have taken action and avoid that situation. That's where we're gonna, we, we need to go after. And make sure as you develop a comprehensive system, system that is complex to develop, that is gonna take time to understand what you want, it's gonna take some time to work with your partners to, to, get, it, to get it right. Make sure that you extract the right information, but also adapting to the different users. What information should be given to my team doing feed distribution? In the, in the pen. What information do I need as a, as a manager, as the owner of the farm? What information do I need to provide to my nutrition consultants so they can do a better job for me? Make sure that all that is considered because that will increase the value that you can capture from your, from your data system. Okay? So at the very end, which is that's the topic of the, of the conference, is about unlocking the power of data analytics for farm services, for your farm decision making. Okay? It is about making the service or the decision making more efficient. So it has to be timely and valuable. It has to be focused on what is most important for you. And it has to happen as soon as possible so you can take action on, on, on that specific issue. It is about personalization of the advice. It has to be related with your farm, with your circumstances. It has to consider what changes might happen in my farm, whether as we said, farm, environment, animal behavior, pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So really it's adapted to my needs. Having market standards is good. It helps a lot. But technology allows us now to go deeper into that and get things customized to my farm. So that should be a way to go. It has to be adapted as much as possible to real data. Probably not everything makes economic sense that you measure real-time data, but there are things that eventually, that, that eventually will make sense that you invest in having real-time data. So do that move from theoretical academic models to real-time models. That's always gonna help you to take decisions and to avoid problems. 
Make sure that the, the data is transparent. You own the data that you provide. Make sure also that the data that is given to you can be shared across the different people working in the farm. So at the end, you get the benefit of the, of the, of the data management, okay? And third, as I was saying before, let's create that data lake in a way that we can uh, run big data analytics because that's the way that you can go much beyond just control, just beyond generating alerts, just thinking through how the future might look like and what is the course of action, what are the turning points that I should be focusing on my farm. This is critical at the end to receive a much better service that is more tangible that you can really act on and transform into money, value to you, that will have a much limited number of errors and they have much bigger customization possibilities for your specific farm, okay? So, wrapping up here, you need to have a system that will help you to make decisions that are better funded, that are data driven, that are substantiated with the value that you already have in your farm, okay? Make sure that data is integrated, that the advice is proactive, and that you can think it's strategic in the way you're treating your farm information and the way you're planning how you're doing things yourself or with your partners that are helping you on farm. Make sure that you and your partners are equipped to do that. So make sure you start thinking how you build that asset. Connect with partners, connect with other companies, give it a thought, think of the things that we've been talking about. But certainly in the next, not many years, this is gonna become something that is uh, gonna be real day or daily basis applicable to a farm. And you need to start thinking through, find the right partners, find, find the, 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 the system that works for you and that will take you to a different level. Technology is ready. There's been significant progress in the past two, three years in technologies applied to farming. Some of them are almost in a commercial grade model. Some of them are getting to that situation soon. So make sure you think through so when you get people visiting you, you have your own opinion. You have been assessed the way you need it to say, okay, this is the way I wanna go. How can you help me? Okay, so that's all from my side. Um, so I'll, I'll, I think we're gonna open it to questions if there's any. Raise, <clears throat> don't be shy, raise your hand. Question over there. Oh, sorry. Can everybody hear me with this or not? Okay. How do you see blockchain technology affecting the egg sector? Is it only going to be on the production side to track the production through, or do you see it on this part of analytics too? Yep. So that, that's a good question. I, and I think it touches things that we mentioned about traceability or across supply chain value. Blockchain. And there are people in favor of that technology, people that still have some doubts, but I think conceptually it's a technology that will be a winning technology, as you said, across the supply chain. So we can probably gonna be seeing more data exchange through that technology from the crop side, through the farm, into the, into the processing and retailing. So that's a data model that affects more steps in the chain. So probably it's gonna take a little bit more to understand what is the best way to apply it, but I would agree with that comment. I think that's gonna be one of the technologies that's gonna be eventually applied. Other questions? Oh, sure. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, computer power, of, uh, uh, what do you wanna call it? Um, uh, internet capabilities or speeds, you know, do you need broadband service to the yeah. farm? And, you know, for your data collection and transfer, how much are you limited yeah. in this area by, by those kind of limitations? Okay, so great question, because that's been traditionally one of the limitations to apply these big technologies into farm. Uh, and it's still a barrier in some, 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 some places. Nevertheless, the technology is not only advancing into the analytics, the data power, We've seen in the past year how people that we are partnering with have been able to move uh, processing from big servers into equipment, reducing the need to have wide, uh, big, big connection, yeah, wide bound into, into the internet, and generating the processing at farm level and just 
sending into the cloud the insights that can be run through an analytical model. So that allows, in most of the cases, to do with just a 4G connection, which is fairly inexpensive and very feasible to apply to a farm. Uh, same as a wireless connection to different robotic systems, that also helps to reduce the installation costs and, re and reduces the, the, also the, the, the need to, to move data from one equipment to another. Questions? Any others? Ricardo, as you look at the uh, dashboard that you're building for the dairies, um, what pieces of information have you found to be the most valuable to really track yep. uh, closely? So um, I'll, I'll be fully transparent with you. We are working on the data lake. We are generating some dashboard. It's just the first step of where we want to get. So we've done significant progress into the past uh, year. Now we are moving into more advanced analytics. Uh, we are exploring opportunities to capture data that specifically are going to be measuring 24-7 animal behavior. I think that they will take the ability to measure sorry, to, to, to drive analytics and advice to a different level. Obviously, there are challenges uh, to, that, to those technologies. So we've been fairly, an, this year, analyzing what is best. And what is best means, do they provide accurate insights? The, most of them apply artificial intelligence models. Are those artificial intelligence models accurate enough so they tell you really what the animal is doing? There are some that are, some others are not so much. Uh, and also, are they cost effective today? When you're going to go into a farm and apply a system, is that something that is going to cost 10 cents per cow per day? Or are you talking about you need to, to, to pay $1 per cow per day? Because even if the technology works in those two scenarios, some, in, in one of them is not feasible, right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's things we're going, we're going through. And there's a couple of things that we consider are pretty interesting. Uh, if everything goes well, we'll be able to do final validation in the next few weeks of some of them. And we'll, we'll, we'll introduce our plans there that are going to take us from different step in our data lakes and being able to apply much advanced for uh, much advanced analytics yeah um, so kind of a good segue um, you're talking about uh, running AI models and uh, big data and data lakes etc um, what are what are your plans or your, like your opinion on providing some transparency to producers about how those black box system works so if you're creating AI models that are forecasting for us or creating some KPIs for us that uh, you know only you guys have through your integrations uh, how are you promoting confidence on the producer side that I can believe in your data since we regularly have a, a very messy system with not <laughs> yeah, much uh, confidence built in? Yeah, no, that's a yeah, good point. Good point. Um, so uh, there are certain outcomes of analytical models that you will be able to, to compare against, against your output, right? If you are predicting that this animal, based on this nutrition and this behavior, is going to get to this level of production, obviously at some point you will be able to prove and assess the accuracy of the model, right? That, those are ones. There are others that because we are not going to have the, the measurement today of the output, um, we ourselves, and obviously uh, that's something that we're doing internally in Cargill, we are validating the accuracy of those technologies, right? When we get to a farm, I think it's very healthy and very valid that the discussion with our customer will include that piece that you're saying. So you're bringing these specific insights. And there are certain, a certain analytical uh, engine, artificial intelligence model that you're applying. How can we both feel confident that the decisions that I make are based on an accurate system? I think there are ways to prove that. Depends on the specific technology that you're using. But it's, it's a valid point. And I think it's, it's it, any relation in these new things that is going to be, as I said, challenging, is going to require dedication and, and work together as we go. It has to start from the base of trust or from the base of sharing what we know so we are feel comfortable where we're going. That's a good point. Yeah. Are you start, starting from the beginning or are you borrowing technology from another industry that's farther ahead than us? So we, we are a 150-something years old company in Cargill that traditionally has been doing everything by itself. As we were reviewing where we want to go with this, it started like two years and a half, three years ago, we came very quick to the conclusion that we alone will not win. So uh, in this period of time, we have very actively started partnering with others, talking to others, so we can bring technologies into the space that are going to be meaningful. So to your question, 
it will not only be a Cargill developed uh, solution. We might partner with others and we will partner with others. And yes, there are technologies that are starting to be applied to agriculture or data that come from other industries. Yep. One more question? All right, if not, I want to thank uh, Cargill for making this presentation possible today. Thank all of you for participating and join me in thanking uh, Mr. Daura for uh, this Thank fine you. presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next session in this track, uh, titled is uh, Robotic System Right for Your Dairy, will begin in a few minutes. Thank you. Well, grab a seat, everyone. We'll get started. Good morning and welcome. Uh, to the dairy technology track is a robotic system right for your dairy. Um, really pleased that uh, all of you made the effort to come here today. I think we have an outstanding panel to talk about uh, and discuss the, the merits and the uh, decisions that have to be made when investing into robotic dairy. My name is Greg Steele. I work for Compure Financial and Compure Financial is the sponsor of the speaker and delighted to be able to bring it to you. So what comes to mind when you think about automa automated milking systems? All those things that you see up there, data, cow health, labor efficiency, maintenance, co maintenance cost, flow, feeding. <clears throat> Why are robotics relevant to the dairy industry? I'm sure you can all answer that question. It's because of labor. We've uh, the dairy industry has done a wonderful job uh, evolving into a, a commercial model and as such has relied on immigrant labor to milk our cows. And uh, that equation and that landscape is changing as we speak. And uh, technology is uh, not new to agriculture. It's, it's, uh, uh, agriculture has always been a, a front runner, an early adopter of technology. I would say, though, based on my experience, um, the issue with labor, reliable labor, is certainly moving that technology down the pike a lot faster than it may have uh, without the shortage in labor. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> Compure would like to uh, um, be very happy to introduce our, our panel at this point in time. Our first speaker is a partner in Green Wave Farms located in St. Michael, Minnesota. Mark began his farming career after graduation from the University of Minnesota where he received his degree in animal science. Uh, Mark is the third generation to operate Green Wave's dairy along with his brother Paul and now more recently the fourth generation, David. After many years of hiring local high school students as part-time help on the dairy, the decision was made in 2014 <clears throat> to install a robotic milking system. In addition to the dairy, Mark is active leader in the agricultural uh, community uh, with uh, involvement in the pork producers, American Dairy Association, 4-H, and FFA. In addition, Mark served 14 years on the board of Federated Co-ops and just completed his eighth year as a board member of Land O'Lakes. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Burning. Our next panelist is from Swiss Lane Farms located in Alto, Michigan. The mission for Swiss Lane Farms, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. I think we can all agree that's a very noble mission. Swiss Lane Farms was founded by Frederick Ersch, who immigrated to the United States from Switzerland at the age of 16. Eventually, Frederick was able to purchase a tract of land in Michigan, and Swiss Lane Farms began. The Ersch family has a rich history committed to agriculture. Tom is a fourth-generation partner of Swiss Lane Farms, and his focus is dairy operations. 
In 2011, when Tom and his brother Matt decided to return to the farm, a robotic milking system was installed and invested in. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tom Ursch. Our third and final uh, panelist has spent his career helping dairy farmers understand their business and particularly their financials. Steve works tirelessly to budget and track his clients' performance so they can make the best decisions possible in their operation. Steve began his career with Land Lakes Dairy Business Service, then served as the Chief Financial Officer for Emerald Dairy, uh, moved on to Ag Star Financial, where he uh, spent time as a credit analyst. And uh, lastly, uh, Steve is a business consultant for Comptor Financial today. It's my pleasure to introduce the rock star of dairy business consulting, Steve Bodart. Yeah. <laughs> Live up to that, Steve. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, I'd like to encourage the audience to ask questions as we go. Uh, we're gonna cover, um, oh, excuse me. At this time, I'm gonna uh, bring, uh, uh, allow Mark uh, Burning to provide some background and summary uh, regarding uh, their operation in St. Michael, Minnesota. Mark? Good morning. Um, as you said, Greenway's farm has uh, four main beliefs. Number or they, and they all start with F. Faith, family, farming, and friends. Um, our family stays together. My brother and I farm together for the last 25 years. And as he said, it, it, you know, it's now a four-generation farm. Uh, farming, we keep the farm healthy at all costs because that's going to keep us healthy. And our friends, it might include our neighbors, which we have lots of them, 30 miles northwest of the Twin Cities, uh, we inhabit 600 acres. Um, if you draw a radius around us of 12 miles, it's probably encompassed about 150,000 people. You think I'm nuts putting a barn in that spot, but cities only grow so fast, and uh, the bigger the ring around the city, the slower the growth. When I was a young kid, they said it would be nothing but houses where I live today, and it's still two and a half, three miles away. Um, it also includes like our bull calf buyer who we've had for 17 years. We have a custom chopper we've had for 14 years. Um, we, we work well with the neighbors. We buy crops from them. They take um, manure and pay for the pumping of that. They also plant our corn. In 1999, my brother and I and my father decided to build a flat barn parlor for 200 cows. We soon realized we didn't have a adequate calving and prefresh area, so we added on to that in 2001. We, had a, we gutted our old barn to make a step-up flat parlor for uh, 12 stalls, it's double six. Um, in 2004, my father developed cancer. Um, my brother and I and my mom uh, took him for radiation, chemo treatments, took a lot. We had to hire a lot of extra help. Before that, it was pretty much dominant, us three working on the farm. Um, in 2006, he passed away, and my brother and I decided, you know, family's pretty important because he died at the age of 64. Um, so we decided we were going to continue hiring help and uh, spend as much time as we could with our families because our kids were young. 2010, we decided to build a calf barn feeder before we were at huts outside. And uh, we built a new barn for our calves with an auto feeder in there, um, hooked up to the internet system. And um, to make a, a long story short, on Christmas Eve, our calf feeder broke down. And uh, we called, this was on a Thursday, I was hoping he'd get to it by next Monday to fix it. Um, it was still working, we just couldn't read the results. And uh, make a long story short, by one o'clock that afternoon, it was up and running. 
uh, that made a big impression down the road. It sold them eight robots. Um, so service was a big key. Um, 2013, the economy was turning around. Labor shortage was getting tighter for us. Um, one thing about our farm, we've never advertised for labor. We've never um, gone out and searching. Sometimes we've been a little thin, but we've never been out of labor. With 150,000 people around us, we have a lot of people, but very little knowledge of what's going on. So the people we hired, we had trained from scratch. Some of our employees lasted five minutes. Some lasted six years. Um, you know, they just weren't, those that didn't last long, they had to buy into the beliefs that we had that the cows and, and were our number one priority. So in 2013, we started looking at robot barns and planned a robot expansion to start in April of 14. Um, that Christmas, my son, who had gone to uh, school for ag engineering and later transferred to ag systems technology degree, asked me if there'd be room for him if he came back on the farm. Well, that was in December, and our plans were pretty well made. We knew if we wanted to go bigger, we'd have to go through the CUP process, and we decided to continue with our plans and maintain our old barn running at a smaller capacity. Um, we soon realized that that old barn, we were spending three times more milking 80 cows than my son was milking in the robot barn, uh, 240 cows. So we recognized that the robot barn, with the grooming brushes, we were reducing our, um, you know, we, went, we were no longer manging our cows. We put alley scrapers in. We put a cross-ventilated barn with baffles in. Uh, we inlaid rubber by the feed alley, encouraged the cows to eat. We put water beds in. Stalls were larger, and we had foot baths. And it was a better working environment. Um, in 2016, we got our CUP approved. We found out who our friends and who our enemies were. Luckily, we had a lot more friends than enemies. And we expanded to eight robots. We had already put the um, expansion plans in the first phase, like extended the water lines and the, and the manure lines. So that was all in place. Plus, a lot of the electrical stuff was already done the first phase. Um, improvements to, to the robots gave us a 16 to 18 pound increase in milk. Our preg rates changed from 17 to 34 percent and we dropped BST at the same time when we moved to the robot barn. Our cull rate has reduced from 33% to 17, and some of that 17, I don't think that's gonna change much, but some of it is because we're expanding. Um, we're not culling quite as many animals. You know, there's a few more we'd probably like to cull, but they're on the cull list, but we haven't just pulled the trigger. Um, if, if cull cow price was higher, we probably would, would be uh, more incentive to sell them. Our semantic cell dropped from or 220 to around 100. It jumped up a little bit here due to certain changes, but um, not very imperative to speak of. Our health improved. We had better record keeping on the computer. And one, cow, or one person can move any cow or a bunch of cows in the barn. Uh, financial returns for us, um, besides giving us more milk per cow, our breeding uh, has our breeding costs have gone down 40 percent, and this is on a per hundred weight basis. Our vet bills are down 37 percent because we're able to recognize cows faster that need help. Um, we have a reduced hiring. We dropped our are hiring 80% of our outside hiring. So all we have is a couple employees now. Um, and basically they just come in the evening to do some cleaning. Um, expected cost was depreciation increase, which we had calculated in. And we had a maintenance cost increase of 10 cents per hundredweight. Unexpected cost was our insurance went up. Um, we didn't plan on the increase to just the amount of dollars that were in that robot barn. And uh, 
Our foot care expense had gone up. You need those cows mobile. To give you an idea of our labor savings, this is for, you know, we're milking 450 cows. As we move up to 480 or 500, it's not going to change. Our, our day is two people going to the barn at 430. Uh, you check the computer, see if any cows need routing or checked on, and put them into routing. We start collecting cows, and by 6 o'clock, we're done with our collect cow list. At that time, we'll feed the newborn calves that are under four days old, and we'll breed cows or check on hospital cows. Um, 7 to 8 or 8.30, depending on the day, we'll bed on Tuesdays and Fridays with sawdust. Our vets every other Monday, and that takes an extra hour. Uh, we do foot baths four days out of the two, every two weeks, Tuesday through Friday. So two of those days are on bedding days where we're moving the cows anyway, because our foot baths are on the opposite ends of our, our uh, robots for various reasons. Uh, we clean the stalls, scrape, and by 9.30 we're done. That's our quiet time. We'll check the computer, we'll do maintenance. Um, then 3 to 4.30, we'll collect cows in the evening again. Our part-time help will help with that. And um, my brother will do feeding at 7.30 7 in the morning. That's kind of an important role because that's when our robots are washing. That's when we're moving our cows through the footpath too from 7 to 8.30. So we're doing the least disrupting of animals as possible. When we are, it's, they can't get milked anyway. And then one of us will come back around 10 to, or 8 to 10 at night and check the cows, see if anybody needs breeding or calving problems, difficulties. And then on weekends, one and a half of us, one's there all day. For the most part, we take the afternoon or the um, middle of the day off again. But we'll do the morning chores and evening chores, and the other person will just do the feeding in the morning. And then we'll have a part-time person come in on weekends. Two times a day or two times? I was a two-time a day. We're getting 2.9 turns now. So that was a big difference. If you're going from three times a day into the robots, you're probably not going to see as big an increase in milk. And that's, you know, that's pretty much how Green Waves runs right now. So. Thanks, Mark. Uh, by the way, this is a, a picture oh. of uh, your family. Yeah, this is my son David and myself and my daughter-in-law, Sarah. We're dressed in black. And uh, one in the middle is one of our employees that's been there for four years. And two of her brothers both worked for us also. She uh, was runner-up at the Princess K in Minnesota this past year. So, uh, And she's not from a dairy farm because they can... They, work for a dairy farm and run. She was very hesitant about running because she wasn't from a dairy farm and didn't think they'd choose anybody, but she was one of the 12 finalists and was ended up being the runner up. So um, pretty impressive for our farm that actually we've had seven girls run for our B County princesses so from our farm over the last five years. So. We are an equal opportunity employer. So. <laughs> Impressive. Tom, you're up. Good morning. I'm Tom Ursch from Swiss Lane Dairy. At home, I'm Tommy because, uh, as you can see, there's two Toms in the uh, ownership uh, order there. My dad is one of the senior partners, uh, along with my Uncle Fred, my Uncle Jeff, my brother Matt, and my cousin Annie and I are the fourth generation. Uh, to be in ownership of the dairy. Um, our dairy started in the early 1900s when my great-grandpa came over from Switzerland and uh, married, the, married the neighbor girl and uh, bought this tract of land. And we've uh, gone from a sustenance farm where he milked a couple cows, uh, had a big garden, and just did what he had to do to raise his family off the land to um, what you see in the picture here. Um, and uh, the robotic dairy came in, in uh, 2011, and that's the red barns up in the far, uh, in, in the top of the picture there. Um, a little background on 
on uh, some of the uh, owners. My uncle Jeff is the only one of the senior partners to have left the dairy to work elsewhere. Um, my dad and my uncle Fred have never left the farm. So, uh, like a lot of uh, like a lot of you, they never they were needed on the farm from day one and um, never had the opportunity to leave or um, and that's kind of shaped some of the way that our, uh, our, tran our family transition plan is going. Um, my brother Matt and I both spent significant time off the dairy. Uh, my brother worked uh, for Agstar doing um, financial consulting for four years. I worked uh, for a, the local feed company selling feed and doing nutrition for seven years. Uh, we would both tell you that uh, we would not be in uh, management position on the dairy had we not done that. Uh, we would probably be uh, hauling manure and taking orders from our uncles. So, um, and probably be gone by now because uh, nobody puts up with that for too long. So, uh, the best thing we ever did was leave the dairy, but uh, um, our, we have some core values in our business um, and uh, they are um, God honoring conduct, light years ahead, focused on the cows, becoming, product, becoming productive people, and making hay while the sun shines. I bring that up because all the decisions that we make, while we're not perfect people and the six of us in ownership don't perfectly reflect those values every single day, they are a, a, a guide for us when we're making decisions. Every decision we make, we have something when we don't know what's right to do, something to come back to. Um, this is kind of a picture of the, the ownership families, my grandpa and grandma are still uh, alive and well and living right on the dairy, and grandpa can't hardly walk, but he can mow 10 acres of grass if you get him on a mower. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so my brother and I uh, were busy until 2011 uh, helping other dairymen make money and be profitable and 2011, 2010 and 2011 were great times in the dairy industry, and we were we were looking at our, uh, our family dairy uh, and saying, well, we can join the fun that the rest of the Michigan dairy industry is having if we just go home. Um, and our dad and uncles weren't getting any younger. And um, we, through some family consulting, realized that the best way for them to ever redeem the equity that they had in the dairy was for us to uh, successfully run the dairy. Uh, so in 2011, my brother Matt came back to the dairy not long after I did, and we started planning. We knew before we went back that we weren't going to go back to the dairy at that time. You can see in the, in the uh, timeline that we were about uh, 1,300 cows, and at the time we were about 4,000 acres. Um, and uh, we knew that we couldn't stay at 1,300 cows and 4,000 uh, 4, acres and feed our families and pay us what we wanted to make off the dairy. So we... Uh, planned a 25% increase in cow numbers and land base uh, that all happened in 2011 and 2012. Um, the end of 2011 was when we fired up the robot dairy. And I'll tell you, as the cow guy, uh, my brother's the business guy. He's the bean counter. He works closely with Steve, and I'm thankful that he has that skill set. Uh, but I'm the cow guy and the people guy. And uh, Facing my first opportunity to manage a new dairy, uh, I vehemently argued for a double eight parlor because I knew all about parlors and management of parlors. And I was like this, why would we throw everything we know out the window to milk cows? And nobody in Michigan had ever milked cows with eight robots before. So it was kind of um, foreign, foreign water for us. But uh, after putting all the spreadsheets together and um, looking at the, uh, we'd looked at a five-year projection, uh, looked at what those robots might be worth in, in five years, and uh, looked at what our potential labor savings would be, and um, also looked at all the data that we were going to have, and, and we went and looked at a few new shiny robots, and we're really impressed with those. Unfortunately, we didn't look at the barn when we went and looked at the robots, um, but that's okay. Um, and uh, I was convinced to, uh, to go along, and once I was convinced, uh, we all were, and it was, 
looking back, it wasn't just it wasn't just a financial decision for our family and for our, for our business. We were going through the succession plan, the, a new generation coming in, and those don't work very well in most situations. And we needed something to be on the same team about on our dairy. I don't know if any of your dairies are that way, but we needed something that we could like pull together and all be on this. And we were, we were all uh, very dedicated to making this robot decision work. And I remember uh, sitting in a, a, a meeting with the bankers when we were trying to sell them on this idea. And, and one of, I can't remember which one, but they asked, well, what are you gonna do if they don't work? And we uh, thought for a minute, and I remember my dad said, you know, we've put alley scrapers in 10 years ago, and we have alley scrapers in all of our barns, and you can walk, drive around the countryside and see lots of alley scraper cables out in the yards where people pulled them out because they didn't work, especially in the wintertime, it got cold, and they just never went back in. But we've been the kind of people that when we embrace technology, we commit to it, and all of our alley scrapers are still in the barns. So... Um, Kind of uh, another part of our business, uh, uh, you see the Dairy Discovery uh, picture up there in the corner. We, uh, like Mark, we're very close to a large metropolitan area. Grand Rapids is, uh, I think the metropolitan Grand Rapids is up to 2 million people. Uh, so very, and, and very affluent, the most affluent part of Michigan is right in Grand Rapids. And we are 20 miles from the city center. Um, and we have felt the, the uh, social pressure to not uh, say we were here first, and so you'll deal with us the way we are. We've really felt the pressure to um, bring the community in to, um, to be connected to our consumer. So we started a business we called Dairy Discovery uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, my cousin Annie runs that, and uh, we take we're in the process of making Dairy Discovery a nonprofit. We take about 7,000 people a year through at this point. Our goal is to get up to about 30,000. Um, and it's, for us, it's not, uh, it's not about the money. Uh, there's several, and it's certainly not, not the convenience to all of our employees and our uh, managers because having the kids around and, and school buses in front of the shop and busy times, I mean, our people would just as soon shut it down and there's days, you know, when we look at what that's actually bringing in, we would just as soon shut it down too. But every vendor that we work with and uh, everybody that comes through Dairy Discovery says you can't, you can't stop doing this because it's too important uh, to our industry, to the industry, to our community. People don't know where their food comes from anymore, and uh, so that's a, become uh, a large part of the identity of our business. Uh, is just the um, our, our passion for showing the community how we farm. Um, I don't know if we have any, I'll, I'll go over a little bit. Uh, this is kind of a, just a brief comparison. So we do, uh, we still milk uh, 1,500 cows in a double 16 parlor, a half a mile from the, the robot dairy. There's some synergies there. We calve everything at the robot dairy. Um, so we have a centralized calving, which works really nice. And uh, we have a centralized feeding center, um, share sand equipment, all that stuff. Actually share manure systems too. We bring the, the manure from the robot dairy back to the uh, conventional dairy and process the manure. We bed with reclaimed sand. Um, but these are just some quick comparisons um, on production. This is 2017 numbers. Um, Main dairy was almost 88 pounds of energy corrected milk, and the robot dairy was 92. And that's like a that's that's the history of our. I mean, that's not just 2017. It was the uh, six years we've had robots. It's these numbers have looked very similar. You can see butter, fat, and protein are pretty similar. Always a touch lower at the robots. Um, somatic cell count runs neck and neck uh, for the most part. The big thing that's going to stick out in this slide is the 33% cull rate versus the 22%. And this is, we see this year after year after year, the lower cull rate. Uh, but you'll also see the higher death loss at the robots. And uh, some of that is a function of the low cull rate. And some of it's a function of the robots and the management style. 
Um, being the cow guy, this is kind of a humbling slide for me because it points to uh, some of my lackluster management. Um, but some of these cows need to be cold cows, not dead cows. And that's a real opportunity for us, uh, something that we're really focused on this year. But this is something that we do see uh, year after year, the lower coal, coal rate. Um, and, and actually, we've been higher on death loss at the main dairy, but overall, uh, the, I mean, I think it's an 8% differential, um, and it's usually somewhere in that 8 to 10% less cows leave the robot dairy every year than the main dairy. BST or no? Uh, no BST. We, uh, we lost BST in uh, the end of 2007. I think January 1, 2008 was the last, last of BST for Michigan. So this is my family, my beautiful wife, and my three kids, and they put up with my dairy life. My wife, um, my, both of my brother and my cousin and myself, none of our spouses are involved on the dairy, and I wouldn't let her if she wanted to be. <laughs> but but <laughs> that's, thank you. They support us. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Steve, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Bodart, work for Compeer as a business consultant. I'm going to keep my part here pretty brief because you guys are more interested in hearing from producers. But I work with producers trying to evaluate their businesses, understanding where they're at, understanding their strengths or weaknesses, um, and then um, also doing uh, projections going forward, looking at what do we want to do, what are the possibilities, and trying to get producers to think out of the box. Um, anybody that's ever worked with me knows I tend to be the devil. And I tend to challenge them, and no matter what they're thinking, and they'll bring up probably the most negative things that they can think of or don't want to think about. And so part of this, um, we are having a number of clients that I work with that are evaluating the robots and looking at different options. And for me, the challenge is always coming back and saying, what if? Just as Tom heard from the lender there, what if they don't work? I'm challenging them on numerous things. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if the cost is more? What if the milk prices are $14? How is this all going to work? And so that is part of the challenge as I work with producers and looking at this and then trying to make sure as we go forward that we are looking at ways to overall reduce our cost of production, increase our profitability in whatever design we come up with. Robotics are not for everyone. If the only reason we're thinking robotics is for labor reduction, it's the wrong game. Again, it's the wrong game if it's only for labor reduction. So with that, I'm going to bring it back and let it open it up for questions. They're great. Thanks, Steve. Hey, I just realized that I was so excited to introduce the panel, I forgot to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Steele. I have worked in the dairy industry for over 30 years, and I uh, really have enjoyed working with m many of you in this room and many in the industry as they've, they've grown and, and improved your dairy. So, and uh, I work out of Baldwin, Wisconsin for Compure Financial. With that, uh, please uh, ask questions as we uh, go through the discussion here. Don't wait till the end. And uh, uh, I think I'm going to kick a question uh, to Steve uh, since he just got done speaking about uh, uh, robotic decisions. Um, Steve, make a couple comments on the first category there on facility considerations. We don't have to tick through all of them, but make a couple comments on free flow versus guided flow, sand mattresses, and the decision process that you go through with producers as they look at weighing the pros and cons of those. So going through this and uh, starting out, you know, there is a, a fair amount of difference. A lot of times, depending on what the producer, um, some of their thoughts and some of their guidelines are. And we do have to evaluate these, uh, starting out with the free flow versus guided flow. What is your philosophy? How much feed do you want to be putting in the TMR? Or what level do you want that TMR to be balanced at? Versus how much um, are you willing to feed in the robot itself? And so just understanding, going through some of those guidelines, knowing that the more feed that we potentially feed at the robot may cause our feed costs to go up on a per cow basis. 
Um, does not necessarily mean that it will go up on a per hundred weight, but it may go up on a per cow basis. And so going through that philosophy, understanding uh, some of those things, understanding some of the dynamics of both with the free flow or the guided flow, the number of fetch cows that you may have um, in each of those systems. So trying to understand some of those things. Um, the next box or the next item that Greg had on there is sand versus mattresses. Um, you know, one of the things that Mark talked about is, is having minimal disturbances with the cows. And in order to do that, you know, a lot of times we are looking at alley scrapers or flush type situations and then trying to minimize how many times we're entering that pen. So that leads us going away from sand a bit, but yet we all know that sand is kind of the gold standard for cow comfort. So we do have to evaluate, uh, discuss, walk through those types of situations and where does that fit into your management style um, what would be one of the things there. Uh, direct load versus bulk tanks. Um, you can go with direct load with robotics. At this point in time though, that does mean that there will need to be labor on the farm. Uh, they do not have a system that I'm aware of yet as far as transferring from one tanker to the next uh, automatically. So there does have to be a person uh, around for that versus the bulk tanks, we can get the automatic transfer there. So that's uh, one of the things that we go through. And just design considerations, you know, are you looking at trying to retrofit as um, some of the operations are doing? Are we looking at uh, new design? Are we looking at uh, positive ventilation? Are we looking at natural ventilation? What type of ventilation systems? Understanding those things, understanding some of our traditions in barn design may no longer come into play. Our cows will act as individuals now, not as groups. So two feet or more of bunk space may be less of an issue right now. So just walking through some of those thoughts and concerns as we're talking about barn design. Thanks. Um, Mark or uh, um, Tom, do you have a, any comments to follow up on Steve on that? Sure. Uh, we we're a free flow, uh, Laley, uh, robot barn. Um, I don't, I don't know that one is right or one is wrong for the reason that I can just tell you why we made the decision that we did. And it, I, we visited both styles of dairy and, uh, I looked at the gates and the guided flow system and I, I'm not that smart. So, uh, <laughs> I was like, I can't figure this out. So I don't know how a cow is going to. So we, we just stuck with something that I could understand. Um, <laughs> We're a sand, like I said, we're a reclaimed sand dairy. Uh, it's kind of the gold standard for cow comfort, but uh, my uncle that manages the manure system sometimes, all the time, is trying to convince <laughs> us to look at something different. But, um, and I do have an opinion on the direct load versus bulk tanks. We have bulk tanks at the conventional dairy. We have a direct load system at the uh, robot dairy and with the technology and sampling methods of direct load at this point, I feel like we've paid for the bulk tanks. Um, I hate that direct load sampler. It's just, it adds one more mechanical element. Um, and the, it, it's, we've had a, we've had a tough time with uh, sampling consistency. We've had different samplers and different things. I know some people make it work, but uh, that's just kind of what we've seen there. So, yeah. Mark, any comments? Um, well, like, like Tom, we got a free flow also. Um, you know, the more gates you have, the more scraping you have around, and that's all hand scrape. We do have a few catch gates. We have catch gates in front of the robots so we can catch those that we need to. Um, and I don't want to restrict any cow from access to feed. Sand versus mattresses, uh, we have water beds. Um, we had sand for our prefresh pens and it was just a bear to maintain, especially in the winter when it's all froze. Um, we had more trouble in the winter. Sand, sand in summertime is great. Um, one thing, sand's gonna be more corrosive to a robot than um, other materials. Um, we've always had bulk tanks. I'm not familiar with direct loads. And design considerations, we did look at redesigning our old 240 cow freestall barn. 
and put robots on the end, but when we considered the plumbing, electrical, and uh, position of where we would have had to put the robots, and looking back on it now, we have a warmer barn. Granted, it still gets cool in there when it's 25 below, but um, you're gonna have a little more uh, maintenance and watching the robots on a natural vent or colder barn in the winter time, especially. I'd agree with that. We, uh, the, our first winter was pretty tough, uh, <laughs> in, the in the robot barn. There were some things that we didn't consider from, uh, putting heat on them, uh, and kind of closing them off from the cold and, uh, but it didn't take a lot of money. We didn't have to sink a lot of money in it, into it to keep those things running in, in the severe cold. Uh, just one more comment on the sand versus mattresses. Uh, I can't speak for any of the other companies that are manufacturing them, but Lely's done a nice job recognizing that uh, on a large herd in the United States, it's a lot different unit than on a small herd in Europe. So uh, they're now, they're, the new robots come, if you're gonna bed with sand, they, it's basically a sand kit that goes on that robot. And because uh, at first we did wear some things out faster than uh, anticipated, but uh, they've through, through some experiences on our dairy and other large dairies have, have really done a nice job saying, okay, this is a problem, we're gonna fix it. Good. As uh, part of preparation for uh, uh, the panel discussion here today, I actually made a visit to both uh, Green Wave Dairy as well as Swiss Lane Dairy. And uh, when I was at Green Wave, Mark brought up a, uh, a technique, I believe, uh, he uses when he pre-trains heifers. Mark, you wanna tell us about right. that? We, uh, well, we started, we started with the notion of few people had pre-trained cows before they entered or before they introduced them to the milking in robots. And what that is, you run them into the robot area, you drop a little feed in them for them to eat, because that's what's gonna entice them into the robot, and then let them out. Well, when we started in October of 14, I had a Land of Lakes meeting in uh, Las Vegas a couple days beforehand. And we were supposed to start on a Tuesday. They said, well, push them through three days in a row and then let them three days go all, all by themselves. And, uh, well, that would have been right during my meeting when we were supposed to push them through. Well, we're hands-on people, and we didn't want, you know, pushing cows through a new, local, new situation can be frustrating at, at some times. And uh, I didn't want our employees getting hurt or getting upset about that. So I did it before I left. So they actually had six days to freely go in and eat if they wanted to. And if you looked at the days that they were free, the first day you maybe had 10, the second day you had 40, the third day I think you had, we had 50. But by the sixth day we had 400 visits from 160 cows. Well, a couple of those cows were going in there 20 times a day looking for <laughs> feed. But it, it got us to thinking, you know, if they're gonna visit that more often. So what we started to do with our heifers as we bring them in, we bring them in about two weeks or 10 days. In the winter time, we bring them in a little longer uh, just because we don't know exactly when they're gonna calve. And uh, so, but typically about 10 days beforehand, once a day, we'll run them into the, we'll have a pre-training uh, deal just in our computer set up for them. So they'll go in there, we'll push them in the robot room, they'll eat three and a half minutes or allow to be able to eat three and a half minutes. The first couple times they can jump out or try to jump out of the box stall. But by about the fourth or fifth day, they're, they're walking in on their own because they know there's feed in there. And it's really eliminated a lot of problems when they first freshen. I think my son said the last three cows or heifers we brought in, they were able to hook it up in 30 seconds or less because we're not prepping them the first time they come in. Compared to, and you'll, every once in a while you have a difficult one, but I mean, I've seen places where you're gonna spend 20, 25 minutes, two people on one cow just 
trying to keep the heifer steady. And we've eliminated a lot of problems by pre-training our heifers. That's interesting, Mark. Any, uh, any comments, Tom? Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, we don't do that, but uh, I think it, uh, we've talked about having a, a robot, like a dummy robot in our pre-fresh heifer pen. We've thought that that would help. Uh, the way we, uh, being that we have the, the two dairies, uh, we, we have everything at the robots. All of our fresh heifers go back to the conventional dairy uh, for the first at least 10 days. And the reason that I do that is I, uh, to make the robot, because I have, I'm going to for a while yet continue to run those two dairies side by side to make that robot dairy as efficient as possible. Uh, milk speed is the driver of output per robot. So I want to bring my fast milking heifers over to the robot dairy. So I got to figure out who they are, I have to milk them for a few days. Uh, and so it, the other thing that we realize that bringing a, a fresh heifer over that's 10 days in milk is a whole lot different than the day she calves. Um, my best cow guys are still at the conventional dairy. One of my, my parlor manager milks the sick cows in our treated parlor at the main dairy every day. So he's the guy that I want to touch that fresh heifer first. Uh, anyways, so, um, and we've been able to take our milk speed. When we started in the robots, I believe we were around six and a half, maybe seven pounds a minute um, on all the average on all cows in the robot barn. And today we're knocking on nine. So it's really, I mean, over time, it's really helped to hand select those heifers. Feeding is a big uh, consideration in our robotic dairy. Um, I'm sure you, you both, Mark and Tom, have some uh, opinions and uh, perspectives on feeding strategies. Um, Tom, why don't you go first? So I think that's probably one of the biggest evolutions that's happening on uh, robotic dairies. Uh, you know, with all of the benefits that we've seen in coal rate and production uh, at the robot dairy, the, the one big black eye that we have on our dairy is the feed costs. Uh, even though we have... You know, it was what, 92 versus 88 pounds, so four pounds more energy corrected milk at the robot dairy uh, in 2017. I think our income over feed cost over the year's time was still higher at the conventional dairy. And some of that's a function. Uh, Lately argues with me every day that, you know, well, all these other dairies' feed cost is cheaper because we're target feeding low cows and high cows. and putting the feed where we need it. Um, but that may be true on a dairy that buys all of their corn. We're a dairy that produces all of our own corn. We store all of our own corn. We dry our own corn. We grind it. It never leaves the dairy. And when you start paying somebody else to do all of that on your main ingredient and your feed, uh, your cost goes up. And so we are in the process of, uh, we were probably, um, I don't know if I should uh, brag about this, but probably feeding more pounds of concentrate in our robots than anybody uh, because I was, you know, I wanted to see what those uh, cows would do. We do have great, uh, we average three to 3.1 visits. Uh, we don't fetch a lot of cows, and so I'm always nervous to pull it back because uh, I don't want to lose visits in production. Um, but we are in the process of pulling pellets back. We've added liquid feed. We want to try to get down under 10 pounds of concentrate per 100 pounds of feed. Right now we're at like 14, I believe. Um, the other thing I don't want to lose is when I compare dairy to dairy, uh, the, um, I, I always like to look at my top cows and my bottom cows. See, why are my top cows my top cows and why are my bottom cows my bottom cows? And uh, in our herd, I think today we have about total like 40, 45, uh, 40,000 pound cows in the herd. All 40 are at the robot dairy. We have like 130 cows over 35,000 pounds. 125 of those cows are at the robot dairy. So I don't want to clip those girls' wings because I, I believe that the robots are letting those cows hit, the, hit their potential. Uh, but at the same time, we have to figure out that income over feed cost dynamic. Mark? On our dairy, um, our nutritionist does the balancing, and we see him probably about every 
two and a half or three months because he'll do any changes online. Um, they will do, you know, they will send someone to do testing of feed or stuffs and whatnot if cases of rations change or something. Our bunk space, we feed 10 pounds under our bulk tank average for pounds of milk. Um, in the robot, I think they'll get anywhere from, you know, up to 18 pounds, depending on how well they're milking. Average, I think, is around at 10 and a half, maybe 11. Um, but, you know, that's, that's our feeding philosophy. Thanks. Uh, Jamie, I'm going to beg for a little extra time here. Um, we have two areas that we want to cover, and I want to make sure that we give uh, the panelists uh, a little opportunity to, uh, to comment on them. Um, I'm sure uh, hopefully they'll keep lunch warm for us. Um, a, a big uh, change and dynamic of going to robots is data, data management, data tracking, uh, and so forth. And uh, I'll ask Steve just to kick this one off just a little bit. Um, as, you, uh, as you have worked with robotic dairies and you look at dairymen moving to robotic dairies with uh, a vast amount of data, what are some of those considerations that uh, you coach those producers on? So with the robotic dairy, you know, the data management, there is tons and tons of data uh, that is coming out of those systems, uh, irregardless of color. Um, the big thing is what are those key items that we need to be evaluating and looking at each and every day? What are those leading indicators that each of those dairymen need to look at instead of looking at all the vast um, amount of data so that they can then go out and evaluate the cows? So each one of the dairies that I work with, we have some discussions on that um, and making sure that they understand that they're going to start by looking at the technology piece um, the um, data that has been generated and making decisions there before they go out and, and spend time with the cows. But each one it is slightly different and these guys can talk about what they're using. Tom? So yeah, the uh, data can drown you coming out of the robots. I think there's like a hundred data points every time that cow comes in, everything from uh, how many times, uh, how, total rumination minutes to how many times she spit the bolus. To, I mean, you can just look at everything if you want. But uh, Laylee's done a pretty nice job in uh, helping us uh, develop uh, reports that bring the key pieces of data that we need from each cow in to help us focus on the cow that we need to look at every day and make it pretty intuitive so that uh, you don't have to be a, a whiz to... I mean, my, my cow guy at the robot dairy, uh, in the last six months, we hired a new herdsman at the robot dairy and moved our, the, the guy that was managing it. He was a great data manager and great uh, worker and very smart, moved him into managing our genetic program and hired a cow guy uh, to run the robot dairy. And he, he's not a computer guy, and it took him no time at all to figure out which cows he needed to look at every day. Um, I, on 500 cows, it's usually narrowed down to like six. I mean, to, on a heavy breeding day, it might be more with, with breedings, uh, looking at some of the uh, um, uh, activity tracking. But other than that, the, the isolating the, the special needs sick cows uh, is very, very easy. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You can, you can route a cow as long as her flag's on the computer. You can route it to the pen. Once she goes in, she'll come to the pen. Um, activity monitors rumination on fresh cows. We can eliminate a lot of DAs by monitoring the fresh cow rumination. If that drops, get it in the hospital pen so she's isolated. She's uh, more comfortable in there from time to time. And a lot of times in a day or two, she snaps right back. Before, we'd be looking for dropping milk or you know listless cow. Um, we can catch that a lot faster. Um, we're always monitoring the activity shows us heats. They told us it would take seven tracking days to figure that out. Well, when we were pushing cows the first three days, the activity monitor was spiking on these cows, and then they were bleeding off by two days later, and we knew there was, forget the seven-day periods. So. Um, but, you know, we don't monitor our high cows much. We just look at the, at the ones that flag up on the computer. 
will catch mastitis. We may treat just as many mastitises in the, or, or maybe a couple more because the robot isn't able to pull those chunks out all the time. You know, if, you've, if you're hand milking them, you can strip those chunks out. Where the robot is now, he's able to do that. So we may, and they might milk through it in a normal barn. But in our robot barn, we may treat it prematurely and we don't see a drop in milk because of it. We catch it fast enough. Um, so we get a bounce back. We don't lose that uh, down period on some of these harder mastitis cows. There's a lot of other data points. I mean, you could name a bunch, but you, it would overwhelm you if you looked at the computer for the first time. Um, moving on to our last topic, um, I probably should have put it first, but economics and cost structure. Um, I'm going to just make a few comments from a lending perspective. You know, uh, lending on a robotic dairy uh, is new to lenders uh, in, in general. You know, over the last 15, 20 years, there's been, um, particularly in the upper Midwest, smaller dairies have, have uh, put in uh, a couple robots, um, had plenty of land equity. It wasn't that difficult to figure out how to get that done. But when you start putting in uh, 16 or 24 robots, eight robots, uh, it becomes a, a, a different uh, uh, situation. You know, lenders are very concerned about um, making sure that the asset they're financing is paid off in a, by the time its useful life is over. That, that's, a, that's a key principle in lending. So it's, uh, it's interesting as, uh, uh, so lenders are put in a situation now, uh, I'll speak for Compere, you know, where we need to really understand, um, if you will, uh, the intricacies and the economics of robotics because um, we're not gonna be able to get those paid off, especially during the current economics in uh, seven or 10 years. Uh, and I know that's what the manufacturers may say that they, you can achieve, but um, hey, uh, I, I believe uh, what we're gonna find is that similar to a milking parlor, milking parlor last 15 years, sometimes plus, on a, a well-managed dairy. I, I think we're gonna see robots last 15 years plus on a well-managed dairy. Visiting with our appraisers, um, they see no reason to heavily discount robots. They uh, currently, you know, if you uh, put in a new rotary parlor, you're gonna get 80% contributory value uh, for that investment. Um, we'll have to hold them to it, but that's what he said that uh, we could expect with robots. So I think that's pretty encouraging and uh, certainly allows uh, a lender to uh, have clients be able to meet underwriting standards and structure their loan appropriately when we can have those sort of things. Um, Mark, you ticked through a nice list of things in regards to cost structure and cost savings. Um, probably in, a, in summary from an economic standpoint, uh, wh where have you seen the biggest benefit to Green Waves Dairy? Well, I don't know if you could point at the one thing. It's so many factors that, that have, I mean, I listed a bunch of them, and that isn't all of them that we've seen improvement. I mean, even electricity per hundred weight is down 20% um, from the old barn. Even with a cross ventilated barn to a natural ventilated barn with a few fans in, um, just the fact the motors you're running are a lot, um, aren't being used near as much. Um, economic wise, you know, I think one thing you got to consider though is the new tax law is five year depreciation on equipment. Um, I don't know if you're going to pay for it in five years, um, quite honestly. So you might have to recover some of that somewhere else. Um, you know, I was able to extend mine to seven or ten years. We built our first barn in 14. We were able to utilize the bonus depreciation. Um, so that helped going forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to consider. And, you know, the first time I, I still remember Eggstar or Compere saying, are you sure you want to spend that kind of money on on 240 cows, and the second time when I did the expansion, they didn't blink an eye, so. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to management. Are you afraid of computers? Um, you better not be, because you're gonna be looking at quite a bit. Um, 
ease of handling of your, your thing, of your barn. Um, you're going to have to like cows because the ones you deal with are the problem ones. Remember, they don't remember you because they're not used to you anymore because you better have a way to hold them and restrain them. Even drying them off isn't very fun because the teat ends are so small you can hardly see where you're supposed to insert the um, dry off to. Um, you know, it's, you know, we're looking at we're looking at a break even cost once once we're full starting in June of of fifteen dollars a hundred weight. And we've done a lot of things right to get to that point too. So and we don't we don't draw big wages. We rely if we make good money at the end of the year we'll pay out bonuses, so we don't factor that in. We want the farm first, so thanks, Mark. Tom? So uh, just a couple, I kind of have a, some comparative things. I guess uh, speaking on the, the depreciation, we are now close to six years in. Uh, had a fairly recent appraisal. Steve and I were talking earlier. They, he said, what, 82% of original purchase price. Um, that was in the, within the last year, uh, So, um, which is much better. I, I think the, uh, the lender is pretty tickled with that. They were, they were hoping for 50% after seven years. So uh, we're well, we're doing well there. Uh, the uh, maintenance cost, uh, our total cost for dip parts, uh, total maintenance cost is about $8,000 a year per robot. Uh, so it's much higher than the parlor on a per cow basis. But when my parlor, which is totally depreciated out, long ago is worth zero. So there's no asset on the books for that parlor. Uh, so that's kind of a, a part of the math, uh, math problem there. And uh, kind of comparing labor cost, we look at our, our labor costs to milk cows. Uh, between the two dairies, we're right there and at $1.25 to $1.30, 100 weight, just to get the cows milked and taken care of. Um, that doesn't include um, our cropping and all that. And if we, we look at the robot dairy versus the conventional dairy, they're neck and neck. They're about the same at both dairies. One month I might have an advantage one over the other. Um, but we have, we, we, what we do know is that we have three times as many cows at the conventional dairy. And I don't care if you milk cows by hand or with a robot, the more cows you have on a facility, the, the better your economy of scale is gonna be. Uh, our most expensive guys are already hired at the robot dairy, and so I could triple the number of cows there and not have to replace those expensive guys. And I really would only need to add, I would have to add minimal labor. So I, I'm confident that at uh, 1,500 cows, we could be in that 60 to 75 cents per hundred weight to milk cows with, with robots. Steve, I know you have an opinion from an economic standpoint on uh, from robotics. Not me. <laughs> You're the devil, remember? Right. So one of the things that we're always evaluating when we look at the economics is, is that cost of production. And I know that any lender in here is also looking at the cost of production. Um, as I stated earlier, it's, it's not for everyone. But as I'm evaluating these and, and looking at, at working with dairymen on it. I always look at the capital costs and the labor costs together. Where are we at today? If we look at making this uh, transition, going to robotics, where do those two costs come together post uh, a change? And how are those economics there? Along with that, then there is a whole debt structure. We can have great cost of production, potential improvements, but we do need that uh, debt structure also appropriate so that we do not um, are not in a situation where we're having P and I payments that are three, three fifty, a hundred weight. Um, so again, that's working with our lenders, getting them comfortable with the length of life that these um, robotics have, so that we can appropriately, uh, excuse me, appropriately structure our debt. Thanks, Steve. Well, we're getting close to uh, the end of our time. I, I think we've actually run over, but I'd sure like to open up for a few questions while we have this panel up here. Um, yes, right here in the front row. Quick and easy question for Mark.
Mark, I don't believe you told us what brand of robots you have. Oh, we have the Laylee robots. Yeah. Yeah, we have the feed pusher also, so that was a big savings too. Correct. Saved about 90% of our way backs that Juno did. With Trump and his issues he's raising with the dairy industry, it's taken us 17 years to use migrant labor and work into it. Is he going to take them away in one day? I don't know. I'm just trying to make my dairy great again. <laughs> I'm not sure we can answer that question. It's, it's a fair question. Uh, next question. Uh, this is for Steve. Right in the beginning, you said if you're only uh, only looking for labor reduction, that's not the answer. Could you clarify that statement? Sure. When people go into this and only are looking at robotics, um, for labor reduction, I really start challenging their dairy skills. And there's still a lot of dairy skills that are necessary, and we need to be even better dairy managers, I believe, in our robotic dairies because we're always dealing with the exceptions. We're not so much looking at the average cow anymore. Just as Mark said um, in one of his things, the only time you're dealing with a cow is it's a problem cow. And so we have to be willing to um, be a great dairyman. We also have to be willing to work with technology. We have to embrace and understand and be willing to work with computers, believe in that technology, and, and utilize it to its fullest. And, and maintenance of equipment, you have to be able to do that. Because, uh, you know, that thing's working 24-7 always moving, uh, you do have extra maintenance costs, it, or tweaking, I should say. It doesn't always be a cost, but it takes some time to do something with it. John, you had a question. Before, before, when we were just had four, we were up to 5,700 pounds a day per robot. Right now we're at um, 4,800 pounds, but we're not full either yet right now with the expansion. We thought about going, we bought a few heifers, but with the price of milk and everything, we figured, well, we'll just eat it a little bit because our heifers are coming. By July, we're going to be full. And then at that time, we'll probably have heifers to sell, so... So we're running right kind of in our sweet spot right now. It's about 490, 495 cows per robot. That's somewhere in that 62, 63 cows per box. Uh, and we are right there in that 56, 5,700 uh, pounds uh, per box. And we feel like that's pretty, we can achieve that pretty steadily. Uh, I'd really like to, I mean, my goal is to uh, pump 50,000 pounds out of that unit. Uh, in a day, uh, but uh, for us, uh, we just feel like milk speed, keeping those cows comfortable and ready to let that milk down when they come in that box. The harder you push it, the more more labor you're gonna have because you'll have more fetch cows if you push it too hard. You'll know, you'll figure out which the sweet spot is. I think James, back there. Yeah, Tom, my question's for you. With with two operations under the same umbrella, the robot dairy and the original dairy, is there any way for, you said you have lately, so T for C, to dump your data from the robot dairy into your system that you have for the other facility that you can compare everybody equally? Or are you having to look at a, as a manager at your existing system, existing data to compare that separately to your robot dairy? Uh, that's a great question. So we use dairy comp for the entire uh, dairy for and so when a cow moves from the robots to the to the main dairy or vice versa It's uh, it's just a pen change in dairy comp. 
So we do use dairy comp, and I don't know if there's any Valley Ag people here, but uh, that interface could be better. Uh, and I know you're getting pressure to make it better, uh, but there's no reason why all of the data from T4C can't be dumped in there. So get it done. Over here. Yeah, I was wondering how you group strategy your cows' lactations, dump them in any pen, and they stay there. Uh, so we've kind of messed around with that a little bit. Uh, and if I built another barn, uh, knowing what I know now, uh, that uh, my grouping strategy would kind of come into play in that. We have found, you know, lately, and Mark might have a different opinion on this. This is just what we've found that works on our dairy. Uh, lately told us, well, you just want to have, you know, a mix of cows from day one to dry off in your pens. That way it's just evenly spaced out and that's going to be the most efficient. So they never have to move pens. Well, that makes some sense and we tried that. But uh, we've also f found that having cows that are alike uh, in a pen uh, on a larger scale helps us from a management standpoint, helps us really maximize uh, a robot. So we took our oldest, biggest, highest producing cows, put them in a pen, and then we kind of have, and so then we have one pen of those. We have a pen of high producing but smaller cows, uh, and those those four, there's four robots on that side of the barn, and we usually run around 55 cows per robot on those, and uh, they're usually in that uh, 6,500 to 7,000 pounds per unit on those. So those four robots are, and we're not in those pens much. There's hardly a fetch cow. You go in there in the morning to breed a cow, and that's it. I mean, you're not in that pen doing, you're not dinking around with those cows. They are just cranking. And then we have a one robot that's just for fresh cows. We keep them in there as short a time as possible to get them into their other pen. Then we have a first lactation heifer pen um, because those heifers don't, they milk a little faster and not as much um, milk out faster. Their milk speed isn't as high, but just because there's not as much in them, you can fit a couple more cows in that pen. But then what we've really found to be beneficial to us is to have a low group. Uh, that is, um, and so we can let that whole group, uh, number one, we can feed them the way back from the rest of the barn, which saves us about a quarter a day uh, in feed costs. And uh, it also lets us kind of manage the milkings on that whole pen. We don't mind if that pen gets down to two, two and a quarter, 2.4 milkings, because we've got our other pens milking three and a half, 3.6. So that's kind of, that's our philosophy. Um, we have four pens. Uh, like them, we have one heifer pen with one older cow. Um, because our inflations in that heifer pen are smaller, so they'll hook up better, because sometimes the teats are smaller on heifers. Uh, right now, we're adding so many heifers, I think we got about 200 heifers out of the, <clears throat> out of the 440 cows. Um, the other one's an overflow heifer pen with smaller cows in, and then... Um, Two pens, we have older cows and they're mixed. We don't separate high, low. Um, you talk about waybacks, our waybacks a skid load of bucket a day. Um, so. Question over here. How much customization have you done to the milk table for allowing visits on your highest producing cows? Because like, Lely's come like with that standard, we'll let them go six times at the beginning and then down to four and down to three. Tommy, you mentioned you look at individual cows and those high producing cows and you know they get rejected at four and a half hours. Like, so have you messed around with the amount of times that they can go when they're cranking out 200 pounds a day? Yeah, we open it up for those cows. We um, open it up for the, the high producing pens and then we crank it back down for those low producing pens. We, we, have, a, you know, we ha have a limit of six times a day for the high producers, but we do keep inching the amount of milk they need to have to get milked. And then we'll individual cows for evenings. If they're a kicky cow or something, might cause some problems. We'll restrict them no evenings so I don't get a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. Um, you know, it, it'll vary, but typically once a month and then once every once in a while, and most of the time that's a five minute fix. 
maybe a twisted cup or, or a dirty lens. Every once in a while, you got a hiccup of, on a machine or something, and, you know, they're down for a little while. But um, most of the time, we're able to fix it ourselves. Some of the stuff lately requires a service guy to install, like a board or something. But I can change out most of those MQC sensors faster than the service guys. So. <laughs> yeah. Good. Any comments, Tom? Uh, yeah, they... Um I don't take, if I have to take a phone call uh, from the robots, somebody's in trouble. Uh, my phone will ring, uh, but it's, it goes through. Uh, my pen technician gets a call first. If he can't fix it, uh, my service guy, my, ma my main robot maintenance guy, which is a kid that's two years out of high school and doing a really nice job, most of that stuff is pretty... Uh, pretty intuitive. I mean, he's a pretty mechanical kid, but he's not, um, it's not taking a ton of uh, expertise to keep him going. Um, and then if he can't get it, then he, he can call me, but that, that thing shouldn't call me. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Well, uh, it's come to the time where we can uh, go to lunch now, but I'd, first, before you go, I'd, I'd like you to uh, give our uh, outstanding panel, I think they did a great job on applause. <laughs> They're going to be around for the remainder of the program, so don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, Steve, myself, questions about the finances, the economics, the lending perspective of it. Uh, it's been a pleasure for Compure Financial to uh, sponsor the robotics session. Thanks for coming, and thank you so much for your patience. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>